we always talk about nutrition changes if you're in season versus you're out of season. In season, we talk about how you're just kind of trying to survive and then out of season is when you thrive. That's when you, you know, make changes to your nutrition. Hello and welcome to the Eat More Carbs podcast. My name is Jenna Fisher and I'm here with my co-host Riley Beatty. Today, I'm going to be talking to Riley a little bit about her third trimester. Before we get into some of the questions about pregnancy and her experience during her third trimester, we're going to do our high and low section. Riley, can you kick us off? Yeah. So since we're recording this post-pregnancy, I thought that I would share a high and a low a little bit from our birth week. So the high first off is we had our baby girl, Charlie, which we're so excited about when we we were finally able to come home from the hospital. I had a C-section, so we were there for a couple of days. That was a huge high, right? We finally got to be our family in our house, and that was so exciting. The low from that story, though, is as soon as we got home, we were obviously, you know, running around doing baby things, getting things set up, you know, trying to get acclimated back to the house. We didn't notice that the temperature in our house was slowly dropping until about 8 o'clock at night when we started to all get a, a little chilly, and we realized that our furnace was broken. And because we were not home for a couple of days, we hadn't noticed it. We hadn't been paying attention. And of course, it decided that it was going to be, you know, 28 degrees that mm -hmm. night. And so we couldn't get anybody out until the next day to fix the furnace, check out what was going on with the thermostat and things like that. So me and baby girl were up all night because it's not like you can put her under a blanket when she's sleeping because they're supposed to, you know, sleeping minimal things like in their crib and stuff like that. So I was terrified that she was going to get super cold. It didn't end up getting like too, too cold in the house, but it was, you know, 59 degrees, which that's cold. That's it's cold. cold. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you can't put on a jacket or a rear blanket or anything like that. So, I mean, we can laugh about it now, but it was just the epitome of a high and a low moment. Big time. Yeah. Getting to bring her home and then into a house that's furnace is broken. So how long did it take before you guys were able to fix that? Somebody came out like the next morning, somebody came out at, like eight o'clock. And of course, like we were supposed to go to the pediatrician at nine o'clock. They were just like super chaotic. And again, like just a great example of motherhood already was you can't plan for anything. And anytime you think you have it under control, things hit the fan. It seems like that that's kind of been the theme of the past couple of days then. Yes, it has been. But what about you? What are your high and low? My high is that I went skiing. I grew up skiing. I love to go skiing. It's so much fun. It's an expensive hobby, so I don't go very often. But I got to go skiing this past weekend, and it was just a lot of fun. I got to do that with my brother and my husband and a couple friends. So I had a great time doing that. My low is that this past weekend was the Super Bowl, and it's not that I was cheering against a certain team or anything like that, but I really wanted to see Brock Purdy win the Super Bowl because – I'm a huge Brock Purdy fan, apparently. And I think that's just because like he's Mr. Irrelevant and I love kind of like that underdog story and like how he was the last one picked in the draft and now he was playing in the Super Bowl. So I really wanted to see him win. So not that I was cheering against like Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs and Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift or anything like that, but I just wanted to see Brock Purdy win. So my low is that I unfortunately had to watch the 49ers lose the Super Bowl. Have you seen the girl on TikTok that looks exactly like Brock Purdy? No, what? I don't know about this. Yeah, you have to check her out. I think her name is Anna. She looks exactly like Brock Purdy and like does mimics him. In and things like that. Really? Okay, I'm going to have to look this up. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Before we start talking through some of your experiences in your third trimester, for anyone who hasn't heard your first trimester and your second trimester experience, do you mind kind of giving a recap? Yeah, it seems like my first and second trimester were so long ago, especially after these last couple of weeks. But yeah, I think pregnancy for me was something that maybe I didn't expect. And I think even now, you know, being postpartum, there's lots of things I didn't expect. We see all this stuff on social media and we think, oh, this is how things are going to go. And I mean, this is how we also approach fueling and performance and things like that. And for me, it was definitely very eye-opening and definitely very challenging, especially in that first trimester. I was somebody who had morning sickness all day, so really definitely struggled to fuel. And this was something that was really challenging, especially in being a dietitian, because we understand the value and the importance of different nutrients, of, you know, the power of food. Only being able to eat, you know, ramen and Sprite was something that was a little challenging for me. Um, but again, right, we always talk about, you know, we have to make sure that our body has enough energy first. So that was my main priority was just, you know, getting in energy in that first trimester, especially struggling with appetite and sickness. 
sickness on the second trimester. I was very thankful that the sickness went away at about week 17, which was amazing. And then what really happened during the second trimester though was now my challenges became maybe more around like the physical appearance, how I was feeling from a body image and physical activity standpoint. It wasn't as much like nausea and vomiting as maybe navigating some of those mental challenges when it came to now fueling my body and a little bit of a bigger body that I wasn't necessarily used to. During your second trimester is when you were able to start exercising again too. And I know we talked about how it was like slow and sustainable changes and that being something that's very similar to how we make fueling changes is making sure that they're in a way that is sustainable. What were some of the changes that you saw in comparison between your second trimester and your third trimester? So when we originally talked about like breaking up like the second and the third trimester and kind of doing this little series on the podcast, I was like, there wasn't that many changes between the second and the third trimester. But now like reflecting back on it, I definitely think there are some clear differences between that second and that third trimester. During the third trimester, I had a lot of my symptoms come back from the first trimester, which they always say like time was a circle and things like that. But I started to get really tired again. Fatigue was huge. I started to also lose my appetite, which is also, it seems to be common in the third trimester because like babies pushing on things. Again, I started to feel a little bit of nausea as well. So that glow that I maybe had in that second trimester <laughs> kind of went away during that third trimester. And I became a lot more inactive, which is something that I've struggled with, definitely because I just like like to be active. I like to work out and things like that. And I always, you know, thought about how I used to run around the neighborhood, you know, two or three times. And then in that third trimester, I was walking around the neighborhood one time and that was my workout for the day. Things just looked very different, especially from an activity standpoint in that third trimester. How did you navigate those changes with activity level? It's really hard to go from being someone who was so incredibly active to that first trimester of being physically unable to exercise because you were so sick. And then finally being able to kind of work out again in that second trimester. And we talked about how like you were so excited to do that and it felt so good to move again. How did you navigate then that kind of regression to inactivity or less movement in your day? I think there's two big things here. I think first is like making sure that I had a good mindset around it. And we always talk about like on this podcast and with our clients and with our athletes, like fueling focuses. Yes, that pertains to nutrition, but that also kind of goes, I don't know, I think it applies to everything in life. And at that point, my pregnancy and that point of my life, my fueling focus and my focus had changed. I wasn't, you know, training for a marathon or, you know, training for performance or even bone health. At this point in time, I was training and eating to grow a human. And that was my feeling focus at that time. And that kind of goes along with too how we always talk about nutrition changes if you're in season versus you're out of season. In season, we talk about how you're just kind of trying to survive. And then out of season is when you thrive. That's when you, you know, make changes to your nutrition to maybe your mental approach to nutrition, right? Like if you have maybe poor body image or you have a struggle with your mindset around feeling, we really work on those things in the off season because we're trying to survive in the season. For me, being a retired athlete, I kind of had this mindset going into pregnancy where I was in season. Like that was my in season. I was trying to basically survive my pregnancy. I wasn't trying to change body comp or you know, change mindset or things like that around feeling because I had already done that prior to pregnancy. And that's kind of like what we do with our athletes is we work on these things out of season. So once we go in season, just like when I was in pregnancy, we are able to navigate like the things that come up in a confident way. I know we've talked about or talked with someone on the podcast before about somebody wanting to modify body composition in season and how that's not the time that we should be trying to make these drastic changes. We should be focusing on like the end goal, which most of the time for an athlete is performance based, but like this is your Super Bowl, right? Like becoming a mom and that being the goal that you had, that being the fueling focus. So I absolutely love that. What were some of the things that you noticed maybe like with your fueling? What tips would you have for someone that's kind of in that same space or that same time frame of like having less of an appetite, but knowing that energy needs are still there? Yeah. So I really focused on like energy dense foods because again, right? Yes, my appetite was lower. But when we look at nutritional needs in that third trimester, your energy needs and your nutrient needs like actually increase, right? Baby's bigger, they need more. You're also bigger, right? And you've, if you've gained adipose tissue, if you've gained muscle, those are both metabolically active tissues. So you need increase your feeling from just a personal standpoint, not just from a baby standpoint as well. So really looking at like energy dense foods. And for me, trying to get in nutrient dense foods with that as well, right? So things like avocado or peanut butter that could provide energy 
and some micronutrients was huge. Liquid energy, also a great option, especially with lower appetite. I think too, like smoothies were a big thing, but you know, adding in energy dense liquids, right? So like juice or coconut water or milk over water or over something like an unsweetened almond milk or adding in, you know, chia seeds or oats or things like that to get in more nutrients and more energy in a smaller volume of food. I was just going to ask you to define what energy dense meant for anyone who was listening who maybe isn't familiar with that term. But just like Riley said, that is referring to a food or food item combination of something that is lower in volume but provides a lot of energy for our body, which can be really useful if you do have a low appetite but have a high energy need. During your second trimester, you talked a lot about some of the physical changes that you were seeing and kind of how you mentally approached those things. Did you still experience changes like that in the third trimester or was that different? Definitely. Something that you and I have both chatted about is that we're not immune to the messaging of diet culture and also like the internet and things like that. So I think those thoughts and those messages and that, I don't know, I just, the whole diet culture thing is still present for us, but we just know how to navigate it in a positive way. And we also understand that like, at least something that I really practice, especially during times of maybe like poor body image, or maybe if I see something on the internet that I get I don't know, triggered by. I really focus on like body neutrality because sometimes we really focus on like body positivity. It's okay to not love our body all of the time. And there is something that can be said about body neutrality because we understand that we have a body. We understand that we love it, but maybe we don't love it all the time, but it's really separating our worth from what we look like. And again, I knew that this is something that was temporary and I knew that there was so much value that I could provide as a person besides just what I looked like. So I kept kind of going back to that messaging, especially if there was times where I got like triggered by things. Um, I think one of the biggest things that was hard for me is not being able to fit into some of my favorite clothes. We all know that I love to wear black and a lot of my clothes that I wear black, I could not wear. So that was something that was hard because I was wearing, you know, the same clothes every single day. I was not getting to, you know, feel confident or wear some of my favorite clothes. So that was something that was challenging for me to navigate. But because of the work that I've done in the past to help with body image, the conversations, the support system that I have, I feel like I was able to navigate that pretty confidently. Thank you so much for bringing up body neutrality. That's something that I think is just such a great approach towards the idea of body positivity. I feel like every time that I'm on any form of social media, it's you need to be body positive, you need to be body positive, and you need to be body positive. And just like you said, we're not immune to the things that we see online. And I think it can very easily feel disheartening when you don't feel body positive all the time if you're on social media and you are following all these accounts that are body positive, which is a wonderful thing, but it can really feel disheartening if you're having a day that you don't feel that good body image, but to be able to take the approach of body neutrality and being like, I'm neutral towards my body today. Like that is such a powerful tool to have. And just like you said, it's okay to not be body positive hundred percent of the time. Absolutely love that you brought that up. The other thing I want to bring up too, this reminds me of a clip that keeps coming up on my social media. So again, here we are back at social media and it's a woman talking about how like, you know, the last time that she was enamored with somebody like passing in the airport, she never remembered them for a long period of time. Or the last time she saw someone that was super fit at a pool, like she didn't, you know, that didn't stick with her and she didn't remember them long term or anything like that. And I think that really comes back to the idea of like pregnancy is a change in your body. What will be with you for forever is like that you're a mom now and you have a daughter, but it won't be something that you look back on and remember like during that time, you weren't maybe loving the clothes that you were wearing because they were green and not your favorite color or whatever it is. Like what you're going to remember and be remembered by is being a mom and being Charlie's mom versus being someone who like looked a certain way during her eighth month of pregnancy. Like no one's going to remember that. And I probably won't remember that either. And also she's not going to remember that. And like, oh. she, like she doesn't care. No, but she's cute as heck and everyone's going to remember that. So. <laughs> I saw this thing that, and I kind of, I kind of take this approach, but like this has actually really helped me sometimes when I have bad body image days and you'll appreciate this as a dog mom because it started with the dogs, but it was like, what if you viewed yourself the way that your dog views you? Like your dog does not care if you've gained five pounds, lost five pounds. They want you to show up. They want you to be happy. They want you to cuddle with them. They want you to go on a walk with them. They want you to be happy, right? 
And I think that's the same thing with kids too, right? Like look at you through your child's eyes. They want you to be present and there with them because yeah. that's what you're going to remember. Same thing, same thing where like no one's going to remember what you looked like in five years, but they're going to remember if you showed up and if you were present and if you were there for those things and if you were happy, if you were kind. I used to say this all the time when I, especially when I was an undergrad and I was dealing with a lot of my own like mental headspace and where I viewed myself. But I would always say to myself when I had a really low day is that anyone can be beautiful, but not everyone can be kind. Oh, I we love that. Choice. We have the choice to be kind every day. I love that. We're planning to do a fourth episode talking about like your fourth trimester and your birth story. How during the third trimester did you prepare for that? I was actually very anxious okay. to give birth and talking to a lot of other moms as well. Like they felt that same anxiety because you just don't know what to expect. And as somebody who was like type A, like to have everything planned out it was something that you can't really plan for and something that you not you can't really prepare for right we don't know which way things are gonna go or like you know I was like weight training I was taking these supplements I was like ready to push I was like so excited and then like ended up having a c-section so like none of that really worked out but there's I mean that was so beneficial for recovery especially like now I'm four weeks postpartum so still dealing with some of like the c-section side effects but very happy that I you know, prepared for that. But it honestly was kind of a, a blur for me. Like looking back on it, there's lots of anxiety, lots of stress, just because unknown. And then also like that anxiety of what happens after that, like now having to take care of a, of a little human. So all kind of was a blur. I also kind of got lucky because the holidays were at the end of my third trimester. So I was able to be, let's say distracted by the holidays. I think overall, the whole experience was very much more challenging than I thought it would be. And I think that's just me personally. I know some people who love being pregnant, who breathe through pregnancy. It just kind of goes back to like pregnancy is so similar to nutrition in the way that it is so individualized. How we approach it, the symptoms that we have, how we feel. That's why we can't really compare ourselves to anybody else. Again, like I've shared this, especially in the first trimester, like looking up nutrition and all this stuff. I was so excited to kind of like dive into that from like a dietitian's perspective. But then again, I couldn't even look at anything that wasn't a clear liquid for 12 weeks. I think understanding it from like a realistic perspective and I don't know, just how challenging it was. But again, that's just my particular experience and also talking to a lot of other moms they feel similar but nobody really talks about that what advice would you have for someone who is maybe feeling a little bit more anxious or a little bit more nerves in that third trimester leading up to birth how did you cope with maybe some of the added stress that came along with that what would be your advice for someone who might be experiencing something similar i think reminding ourselves that it's temporary like it will pass and then also making sure that you have a good support system that you feel open to talking about it with individuals that you feel like sharing about it. I also know that like being open with your care team is really important. I wasn't somebody who ended up going on like anti-anxiety medication or anything like that, but I do know that there are people who choose to, you know, get help from medication or things like that. And that's totally valid and normal and okay if that's something that you also need help with. Again, that's something that I didn't even know was available um, until I talked with somebody else about it because again, we don't really talk about maybe the downsides and the hardships of pregnancy. I think there's such a focus on like the end of pregnancy and like having a child that we often kind of overlook maybe some of the struggles that pregnant women go through on the journey to becoming a mom. So again, thank you for sharing about this. If someone is experiencing some of the things that Riley kind of mentioned as far as maybe a lot of anxiety or nerves and things like that, just a reminder that you can always be vocal with your care team about what you are experiencing and advocate for yourself. No one knows you better than you. Let your care team know. Like they're there to help you. That's why they're your care team. And I don't think there's anything wrong with asking for help too. Yeah. Especially like asking for help from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint. Again, right? Like I really wanted to have like a natural birth with an epidural, but I wanted to have a natural birth, but like ended up going C-section route because of some anatomy issues, I guess. So that doesn't take away like my ability as a mom, which I definitely felt that at the moment. There's no nothing wrong with like advocating for yourself or asking for help. It doesn't make you like weaker or just take away from your worth. Knowing that you're a planner, what, if anything, did you have planned for like birth with your care team? Like, was that something that you talked about? Like what you were hoping to do before going into the hospital to have Charlie? I was really lucky with like the care team. Like I really liked my OBGYN here. 
like anything that I asked for. If I wanted a certain lab, she like ran it. Like she's very supportive of that. And I think I honestly didn't know what to expect. I know people have like very elaborate birth plans and things like that. I knew I wanted an epidural. <laughs> like that I wasn't playing around with that. And I wanted to have like, you know, like a natural birth if possible. But the most important thing was that she was safe and healthy and that I was safe as well. So kind of putting it in the hands of the professionals to be completely honest, because I could have this plan, I could have Googled and all this stuff, but they're doing this on a daily basis. They're the professional tr kind of trusting them to do what was best for me. So many times we have talked with athletes on this podcast, clients and everything like that. And we talk about how important that trust relationship is between them and us when it comes to even nutritional changes, that trust exists between any member of the care team, whether that be your OBGYN, your primary physician, your pelvic floor physical therapist, whoever it is, that level of trust between yourself and the provider that you're going to see, which on a previous podcast, we have mentioned that you always have a choice with who that provider is, whether that be Riley and I as your dietitians or another dietitian, find someone that you do feel trusting of, because that is such an important component of the care that you receive. Definitely. I mean, if I didn't feel the trust and I didn't feel supported, it would have been a lot harder for me, especially through my entire experience. But because I felt like well taken care of, I've had trust with my providers, it helped, I guess, like lessen my nerves a a little bit knowing that the right thing was happening. Riley, thank you so much for breaking down your pregnancy and talking about some of the things that you experienced. I know for a lot of people that maybe don't have like the guidance of a friend or family member who has experienced pregnancy before to kind of lean on, it's really helpful to hear someone else's experience, whether that be the good or the bad side of things. So thank you so much for sharing. If you have questions specifically for Riley and I that you would like answered on this podcast, you can always leave them in the comments and questions below. You can also find us on Instagram we're at the Eat More Carbs podcast. You can find us individually on Instagram. Riley is at riley.beatty.nutrition and I am at jenna.fisher.nutrition. Please make sure you rate, subscribe, and review to the Eat More Carbs podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And remember, as always, to eat more carbs.